Good evening, everyone, and welcome. <clears throat> our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia. And we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. My name is Adrian, and I'm the Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Centre. I am thrilled to welcome everyone to the autumn series of our virtual museum lectures. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. A quick note for those of you quick note for those of you watching on uh, mobile devices, please check your audio settings in the YouTube app if you are having audio problems. You may also uh, not have access to the chat box, so you can always post comments or questions in the regular comments below the video. While YouTube is our best option for the lecture series, it isn't the best option for interactivity. So please do feel welcome to ask questions in the chat box and we'll moderate them at the end of the presentation. Just a quick note about that. Um, we're in the chat box. Kathleen is in the chat box tonight, uh, but I cannot see the chat box. So I will go to the chat box uh, at the end of the presentation and go through your questions. Um, and I'm really excited to do so. I hope there are some great questions. And hello, everyone. I'm sure there are some notes of hellos. Uh, so hello. I'm sorry if there, <laughs> if there aren't. I'm running blind. <clears throat> okay. Uh, before we start tonight's lecture, let me tell you a bit about some upcoming lectures. Don't forget to mark your calendars. There are only three remaining in our autumn series. On November 10th, we'll present our First World War series, Stories from the Front, featuring letters and news articles from the museum's collection. On November 24th, I will be back with our public programmer, Sarah Nixon, to discuss the Howe Report, a study of the condition of freedom seekers in St. Catharines in 1853. And on December 8th, our curator, Kathleen Powell, will present a talk on local fashion and our new upcoming exhibit, Marking Time, which features the important moments of life and the textiles that go with them. We're already working on the lineup for speakers for the winter. If you have a topic you'd like to see presented as a part of the series, please let us know. Send us an email and we'll try to include it. I sincerely hope that everyone has been enjoying the lectures these past few months. Uh, might I encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you have come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Give us a call at 905-984-8880 during our operating hours to make a donation or drop in uh, to, and make a donation in person if you like. Uh, your donation makes a difference. Thank you. Without the Welling Canal, the, dom the, the Dominion would be little, little better than a home for cats and badgers. St. Catherine's Daily Times, August 15th, 1871. It's one of my favorite quotes about the Welland Canal and I was so excited to say it that I messed it up. Let's try it again. <laughs> I'm just so excited. Without the Welland Canal, the Dominion would be little better than a home for cats and badgers. And as I had mentioned earlier, that that's from the St. Catharines Daily Times, August 15th, 1871. Of the four iterations of the Welling Canal, the third Welling Canal or the second reconstruction has always been, for me anyway, the foggiest chapter of the great historical narrative of our great waterway. It's a bit lost and slightly forgotten in the traditional narrative we're used to hearing about the Welling Canal. Throughout, throughout tonight's lecture, I'll explore some of the history and some of the reasons why the third canal is lost and forgotten. First, perhaps it's a bit of a middle child syndrome. 
the idea of, that the middle ch children get less attention than the oldest and the baby of the family. Raise your hand if you, I'm not, a, I'm the youngest, I'm the baby, but um, raise your hand if you're a middle child. You probably get what I'm, get what I'm trying to get at. It's certainly evident in the way the narrative of the canal has been presented to us. Lots of detail and attention have been paid to the initial construction by William Hamilton Merritt, who overcame great odds to complete the project. And lots of attention is paid to the construction and operation of our current canal. So tangible to us in its great and vast concrete locks. The narrative of the third canal is a bit lost and a bit forgotten, often glazed over on the way to talking about the Well and Ship Canal that we enjoy today. But the purpose, construction, and life of the Third Canal is quite different from the purpose, construction, and life of the early canals. Its story is complex, complicated, poorly documented, different from others, and difficult to communicate to new and non-canal lovers. It's difficult to and it's difficult to uh, successfully and accurately share the stories of the canals within that same frame. Instead, the history of the third needs reframing altogether. Second, and most likely, is the challenge that so little of the third canal remains accessible to the public on public land today. Unlike the route of the second canal, which is more tangible and in public view as a part of our park space and represented in much of our beloved built heritage, the remnants and the route of the third canal has either disappeared, is hidden, uh, is hidden that one is so hidden that one really needs, know, needs to know about them to find them, or is so far off the beaten track and on private lands that over time, the idea and memory of the canal lies solely with those interested and invested rather than the passerby and the local resident happening upon and living around our local history. Speaking of canal lovers, I recognize that many of our audience tonight and indeed on social media uh, in and around the museum's page and, and many other pages as well in our community are big canal lovers and big lovers of the third canal. And so the idea of maybe the third canal being lost and forgotten are maybe absurd <laughs> to you because you know everything about them. Um, and a little bit to me, since we are immersed in the story already. When I say lost and forgotten, I really mean that the story is less well understood, less attended to in the historiography of the canal, less visible in our daily lives, and appears less in our archival and living memories than the other canals. As our other regular lecture, lecture attendees have come to expect from me, this is not a complete history of the third Welling Canal. This is not an A to Z history of the Welling Canal. <laughs> Without the time needed to tell the whole story, I'm instead going to talk more specifically about the historical and historiogra historiographical reasons why the Third Canal is lost and forgotten. So if I leave out information or some important narrative, please note, I do not do so lightly, but also please remember that the purpose of my lecture tonight is not a, not a survey or all encompassing history, but rather an investigation to how our community values and remembers the past. Thank you for joining me tonight. Let's dig in. An interesting and dominant aspect of the Welling Canal narrative is the progression of construction projects, which begs the question, why did the canal need to be re rebuilt so many times? Other canals that we're familiar with, including the neighboring Erie Canal, were not rebuilt in such, expansive, in such an expansive fashion. In the case of the first Welling Canal, reconstruction was deemed as life-saving, since even by the time it opened, the canal was plagued by locks in poor working condition that were too small and mostly poorly constructed. The intention of the first reconstruction in the 1840s was to correct the shortcomings of the first, but also deepen the locks from eight feet to two uh, or two and a half meters uh, to nine feet or almost three meters. 
I should add that the canal's depth was a constant question and was deepened again and again between the 1840s and the 1870s to end up with about a 10 and a one quarter foot depth or about three and a quarter meters deep. The depth isn't really important. The, the actual number of depth isn't really important. What is important is that the depth was a constant struggle for those operating and building the canal. For more on the first canal and the reasons for its construction, you can check out my lecture called Open for Business, the Welling Canal in 1830 on the Virtual Museum Lecture Series playlist on our YouTube channel. In the case of the third canal, reconstruction was driven by new technology and the explosion of trade and economic growth on the Great Lakes. Put simply, the Welling Canal, the second Welling Canal was too small to handle the explosion of growth in traffic and the quickly growing size of new ships. When the second, uh, when the second canal opened for traffic in 1845 fully, the typical vessel that would lock through was one that we might expect from the era, a sail driven bark or schooner type ship with an average cargo capacity of approximately 700 tons and about eight to nine foot draft. For comparison, the Blue Nose 2, so everyone can picture the Blue Nose 2 in your head, is 100, uh, that's not, is 991 tons and sits at six, at 16 foot draft. But the, uh, but by the 1870s, the canal and shipbuilders had almost completely transitioned to steam powered vessels. And you can see that transitioning happening in this photo of the Muir Brothers shipyard in Port Dalhousie near Lock One. On the left of the photo, there's a couple of sail ships, uh, schooner type bark like low uh, ships. And on the right is a new steam vessel. Approximately half of the traffic on the Great Lakes consisted of steam powered vessels by the 1870s. Most were constructed to fit into the locks of the canal, meaning no longer than 140 feet, but the new technologies and materials available meant that ships could be much larger. Ships that would eventually traverse the third Welling Canal could be as large as 220 feet long. The larger vessel, the larger the vessel, the more cheaply cargo could be carried. And so shipbuilders and shipping companies, along with canal promoters, were increasingly frustrated with the limited capacity of the canal. The number of ships and indeed the explosion of growth across the Great Lakes between 1845 and 1860 was remarkable. The settlement and growth of the West, especially in the 1860s, was much more successful than imagined when the canal was reconstructed in the 1840s. Chicago's population, for example, had ballooned from just 30,000 in 1850 to 300,000 in 1870, to just over 1 million in 1890. The new canal was definitely needed. The, part, the parliamentary session papers from the 1871 Royal Commission on Canals details this challenge. Quote, experience proves that the largest class of vessels, especially steam, now plying on the lakes carry property at the cheapest rates. The larger class of vessels, both sail and steam, excuse me, carrying 20 to 35,000 bushels of grain are increasingly year by year are increasing year by year. Excuse me. A very general opinion prevails that steam, uh, that that is the screw vessel, uh, must prevail in the end over sail on the lakes, for it has the advantage in rates of insurance, expedition, safety, and competition with the railways, all important characteristics of the bulky produce of the West. At present, this is a highlighted section, according to the Oswego Board of Trade, three fourths of the tonnage of the lakes cannot pass the Welling Canal, a fact of itself quite sufficient to show why its traffic does not increase. Let's unpack that and some of the other statistics found in the report. 
tonnage, the aggregate number and size of ships uh, had more than quadrupled in between 1850 and 1870 from approximately 140,000 tons to 550,000 tons. That's huge. While the number of ships increased, the amount of cargo passing the canal remained basically the same. Uh, between 1860 and 1869, averaging 2 million tons of goods with virtually no growth, which illustrates the limitations of the canal's ability to move increasing uh, the increasing size and number of ships and tonnage on the Great Lakes. Also of note, the Erie Canal and the network of railroads could not keep up with the tonnage to be shipped. Every trade route was jam-packed with bulk cargo from the west. But at the same time, the limitations of the canal meant that growth had stalled. It would be, especially in Canada, it would be like managing today's 401, Highway 401 traffic on a much smaller highway to the frustration of everyone. The report also noted that trade will always find the cheapest and most efficient route and that Canada was missing the boat by letting trade monies escape through other means, particularly the Erie Canal but also over the railways and even the Mississippi River. Competition with these and other routes was the driving force for the redevelopment of the Welland Canal in the 1870s. And they note that Canada, Canada's economy depended on it. On improving, quote, on improving the Welland Canal, we take the step pointed out to us by the marrying finger of progress. The commercial interests of Canada demand it if our country is to keep pace with the enterprise and energy of the communities to which the St. Lawrence is tributary. This is the highlighted section. The Welling Canal must be considered as that link which is indispensable to the complete development of St. Lawrence navigation. Our great object should be to seek the control as much as possible of the Western traffic and take it to the tidewater. The canal was quickly elevated from a small community-based Niagara project to a canal of national importance. The focus of the canal had shifted from a source of industrial water power harnessed for milling and manufacturing for local benefit to the most important transportation corridor in North America in over just a short 30 year period. And so the purpose of the third canal being different from the early ones, earlier ones, presents a challenge to the, to the preservation of its memory. The agitation to rebuild the canal again came from multiple sources. Locals advanced the cause in the early 1860s, but as Confederation became a reality, the feeling from the Department of Public Works was to wait for the new federal government to take on the project. Indeed, a number of important projects, including how to figure out how to bring water directly from Lake Erie into the system rather than, to, uh, rather than from the feeder canal was put off again until after 1867. Perhaps there was some remaining consternation of the always growing costs of building and operating canals and the pressure it put on provincial government budgets. There are hints too in these early reports and in other sources that the expense of the canal operations and improvements quickly outweighed the trade revenue it facilitated. Money has always been the elephant in the room with regards to the Welling Canal. Investment and budgetary shortfalls in the, during the first canal project uh, delayed the project significantly. The financial impacts that the rebellions in 1837 and the union of the Canadas in 1841 took a, uh, took a toll on the already fragile and slow to grow provincial economy, uh, which delayed the second canal reconstruction. It was uh, obvious by the late, by the 1850s, let alone the 1870s, that canals were money pits. And so the construction and operation of canal projects would always be at the mercy of provincial or national economy and economic crises. For example, a depression in the late 1870s shrunk available funding and delayed construction considerably. Thomas Kiefer, son of George Kiefer, a founding director of the Welling Canal Company noted in 1893 that, quote, our canals, instead of becoming as expected a source of revenue, 
have become a charge upon the public purse. An interesting perspective since the original Well and Canal, well Canal Company was originally intended as a private enterprise. Nevertheless, while ships and shipping traffic grew, the federal government under the new federal government, I should add, under Prime Minister Johnny MacDonald was advancing a more cohesive trade policy, which included the development and redevelopment of major infrastructure, including railways and canals. It wasn't quite yet the national policy proper, but the idea of coordinating and facilitating infrastructure, trade and tariffs was a pillar of the government's economic vision. Funding marked, uh, funding marked for the redevelopment of the canal was quickly announced in 1871. Its place inside the government trade policies and eventually the national policy meant that the canal was to be improved with the entire system in mind, which helped, which helped to determine its size and depth. Though, as we'll see, it was impossible, impossible to make everyone happy. It was quite clear from early on that the new project was to be treated as a Canadian project, not a Niagara one. Local industrialists were seemingly frothing at the mouth with the potential industrial opportunities of a new, uh, that a new canal might offer. When news came that can the canal's enlargement was to take a new and different route away from the second canal, the hopes and dreams for further growth and expansion of the St. Catharines and Meriton industrial communities were pretty much dashed. Again, I pause to note another challenge to the preservation of the third canal, its alternate route. There was never any question that a new canal would take an alternative route for the plain and simple fact that there was not enough space for the necessary enlargement. The system was far too small to accommodate the larger vessels, especially where existing geography wouldn't allow. For example, the locks known as Neptune's Staircase, locks 15 to 21, and the reaches through downtown St. Catharines, which would not allow enlarged ships, especially at the 255 foot length, uh, which were almost double the previous length to pass safely. I'll talk about the new route in just a few minutes. There were practical questions along with the macroeconomic ones. As the canal was nearing completion, the local attitude toward the project did not change. There was a feeling that St. Catharines had been abandoned by the federal government and that the prosperity of the community was being sacrificed for the good of the country. Indeed, Charles Tupper, Minister for Canals and Railways, confirmed the new priority when our local MP, John Charles Reichert posed the following in the House of Commons on February 8th, 1881. I'll just read the passage because I think it's probably too <laughs> difficult to read on your screens. Mr. Reichert, I inquire as to whether the attention of the government has been drawn to the fact that no provision has been made for the turn of vessels of 100 feet keel and upwards in the Welland Canal. And if so, whether it is the intention of the government to remedy this serious defect before the final completion of the canal. Um, the print, uh, Sir Charles Tupper, the principal business on this canal for a number of years at least must be through trade. Therefore, there will be no mills or factories or other places where vessels will at all likely be able to unload or receive cargo on the new line which is about one mile and a half from the old canal, except at Porto Luzi and near the town of Thorold. The local businesses between St. Catharines and Lake Ontario will, in all probability, be done by the old route for years. In all events, it, that seems to the opinion of the corporation and those gentlemen who have made application for the second lock of the old line to be enlarged. It has therefore not been considered necessary to incur expense of forming a basin of the capacity for the largest class of vessels to turn around in so much as the works for that purpose can be done at any future time with equal advantage as when forming the canal. The new channel is nowhere, nowhere less than 100 feet wide at bottom and in short, and in short reaches where there is a curve in the line with uh, the width is great so that small vessels can be turned around anywhere. 
if a period of 10 or 12 years is likely to elapse before the local trade would derive any benefit from the outlay, out, from the outlay necessary to form a basin for large vessels to turn around, the interest on the amount would, by that time, be nearly if not wholly sufficient to do the work. Besides the inconvenience of floating or other unwieldy bridge on the other other unwieldy bridges on the towing path for that period will be avoided. Reichert, this is an argument, not an answer to my question. Tupper, I have not presented an argument, but simply given the honorable member an answer and the reasons for the answer. I have said that there are no such places on the canal. Despite the second canal route remaining open for water power and some ship access until about 1915, the construction of the third Welling Canal uh, away from the urban core of both St. Catharines and Meryton was the most significant factor in the beginning of the end of the industrial might of our community in the Great Lakes. There was a feeling of loss and the feeling of loss and imp of importance and prestige. The canal was very important to the government's new trade strategy but now it was part of a larger system rather than a shining star for Niagara. Similarly, its national and international focus did not yield much benefit for the communities left behind. And here we pause again. A limited, a limited amount of industrial infrastructure was allowed to be built along the route of the Third, third Welling Canal. And so when the urban section was eventually buried little built heritage remained to signal its presence. It's no surprise to our regular audiences that my interest in the Ottawa-Niagara relationship has been piqued, and I look forward to the day when the archives reopen so that I can access more documents from the period concerning the federal government's management of the Third Welling Canal. The new route of the Third Canal is quite fascinating to look at from a historical and modern perspective. Remembering that surveys in the 1860s revealed not enough space for a lock, uh, lock and canal enlargement, an entirely new line was built between Porto Luzzi just south of, uh, and just south of Thorold, completely bypassing St. Catharines and Meryton. A new lock was built at Porto Luzzi, just east of the second canal lock, and from there on the new route progressed southeast towards Victoria Line Cemetery and us here at the St. Catharines Museum. Just a quick note about this map. It's really weird to look at. North and northwest-ish and Porto Luzzi is in the top right corner of your screen. So north is to the to the I don't know which way my head goes in your screen, but north is on the right. Uh, so Lake Ontario is on the right and Lake Erie is on the left. It's very strange. I had to do it this way because otherwise all the text would be upside down if I put it the right way, the way that we're used to looking at it. The new flight of locks used to climb the escarpment curved east of the present canal, just east to the General Motors plant on uh, Glendale Avenue. Eventually, the canal, the channel returned to the main line at Thorold and progressed through Welland onto Port Colbert. And I'll just quickly draw that. I am aware that maybe not everybody knows the canal as well as I do. <laughs> so here's lock two. Uh, this is now JC Park. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, that's lock three. Here's lock two. Oh, there's lock two. <laughs> it's behind my <laughs> uh, it's behind my um it's behind my camera. Okay, there's lock two. Sorry about that. So that's JC Park now. And then lock three, which is also still visible, even though it's kind of filled in. Uh Ontario Street is there, and then it comes all the way out to uh, I can't really tell, but about where the museum is, and then heads up over this way and eh, okay, again, uh, railways here. So the flight locks are sort of here. <laughs> That's enough driving for tonight. <laughs> anyway, that gives you an idea. And, so, and sorry, downtown, um, downtown is, is here. Um, 
Marilyn I. Walker School of Performing, Fine and Performing Arts or the Canada Hair Club building is here. So that gives you an idea of how far away, um, and here's Meriton, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the keg is right here. It gives you an idea of how far away we're talking about uh, and what kind of drastic impact that had on industry. Okay, enough of that. For more on the route and the locations of the locks, I really encourage everyone to explore the wonderful online map project built by Colleen Beard, the now retired Brock University map librarian. Um, you can find it just by Googling historic Welling Canals mapping project. And it has all these wonderful layers that you can select. You can really get down into the story of each of the uh, first, second and third canals. Uh, with lots and lots of overlays. You can see a regular sort of uh, regular Google map. Um, you can see a satellite map here as well. Um, and so I really encourage everyone, if you haven't already, to check this out. It is uh, a super important resource. And uh, we're all very grateful to Colleen for um, putting it together. Uh, it's been, a, I believe, a, um, a, you know, a project of uh, life and love. <laughs> um, I also should note that you can also join us in the spring because Colleen will be on as a guest in, sorry, the winter, winter spring. Uh, Colleen will be on as a guest in the winter lecture series, winter spring lecture series. The experience of constructing the canal would have been very exciting. The third canal uh, has a unique experience of straddling the tra transition between the old ways, horse teams, local contractors and supplies, amateur engineers and surveyors, etc., And then the impact of the second industrial revolution, which brought the advent of new technology to the work site. While the period was full of transition, some elements of construction had not changed. The contracting system used to organize the work on the third canal was very similar to the first and second construction and operation. The contract would be tendered and interest expressed. The difference here is the scale of operation and who is managing the contracts. As in its finances and the third uh, canal, again, was a natural project, national project. The first canal saw mainly local contractors some of whom were usually friends or investors in the Welling Canal Company. Many of the contractors used to build the third were not from Niagara. And indeed, many did not employ locals, but either their own workers or workers from other provinces and countries. Of the 46 offers of interest for the four main construction section contracts for the deep cut in the early 1870s, only one had been active on the second Welling Canal. Interestingly, the canal contract appointments were done similar to, similarly to those on the first and second. A new recognition though, that the system might be corrupt and the, insur and the ensuing political firestorm appeared in both national newspapers and on the floor of the House of Commons, frequently during construction, giving the appearance that the third canal construction was mired by corruption even though the system was virtually unchanged from earlier projects. Instead of friends of the Welland Canal Company, it might be friends of ministers, and which meant that maybe, uh, and, other, and other government members, which maybe meant that uh, contractors were being hired out from as far as Quebec, and uh, so that, you know, friends of Quebec ministers and that kind of thing were being hired for a Niagara project. So it was kind of a, kind of a, a scandalous time. Uh, and of course, everything was a scandal <laughs> uh, in the, the some things don't change. <laughs> the growth of the national press and the attention of the official opposition was able to attract uh, the, the attention that it was able to attract seems that the corruption and, patron, and patronage were rampant, uh, even though it was probably no worse than it had been on earlier projects, which is to say it was rampant. <laughs> But it wasn't worse, I don't think, uh, from, from, from as many sources as I've come across. It does feel like that. And I think the other thing to consider is that patronage 
was fairly normal. And so if we're looking at patronage from our modern 2020 view, uh, then it certainly is scandalous. Uh, and certainly it was scandalous back there, back then, but um, everybody did it. And not as many people did a very good job trying to hide it, I guess. Speaking of patronage appoints, appointments, the idea of hiring, hiring professionally trained and accredited engineers to lead construction and operation was only just beginning to take root. Most of the canal construction and operation were taken on by very able experienced workers, but not accredited engineers, as we see, uh, as we see leading the projects today. Additionally, several canal staff that, that uh, leaned on experience, excuse me, and others were plainly patronage, patronage appointments. In fact, most were aware, even up to the uh, 1920s, when discussing the uh, seasonal appointments for lock tenders uh, and other canal staff, there was a decision between <laughs> there was a decision between uh, two individuals. One individual who had been appointed many times uh, throughout his career by the Liberals and then fired by the Conservatives, and one individual <laughs> on the opposite side who had been hired many times by the Conservatives and uh, and uh, fired by the Liberals. And every, this was an open discussion in the source, so everybody sort of knew that uh, even even positions as low in the service, it's in the civil service as lock tenders and bridge tenders were up for grabs when the government changed hands. The job eventually went to the younger; he's about ten years younger, and so they thought by that time they, it was perhaps more permanent, and so they thought they'd they'd have um, uh, more ability out of the younger the younger uh, employee. Different hiring practices back then, let me tell you. Anyway, uh, most of the canal, uh, da, 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 da. additionally, several canal staff, oh, sorry, let me just get back to my point here. Um, right, so several canal staff leaned on experience, as I mentioned, and others were plainly patronage appoint appointments. We couldn't expect the political system to change so quickly in such a short period, could we? <laughs> It really isn't that shocking, as it was commonplace and quite normalized, as I mentioned, throughout the civil service. However, it was changing and more and more professional engineers, thank goodness, were involved in the canal projects and throughout the Department of Railways and Canals. Additionally, as on earlier projects, some contractors were excellent and others were disastrous. The combination of these challenges between political appointments and local favoritism and the, emerg uh, and the emerging professional class, usually responsible to Ottawa, created several scandals and resulted in either delays or expensive mistakes. Four of the canal superintendents sort of in this time period uh, and uh, da, 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 were either dismissed or suspended during this period for some form of corruption or malfeasance, um, either in contract awarding or general financial or operational mismanagement, including Samuel Woodruff, who had been superintendent all the way back from 1858 until his dismissal in 1871. William Brigger was brought in to replace him, but according to the department chief engineer, John Page, quote, Mr. Brigger's negligence in attending to the canal affairs uh, was detrimental detrimental to public service, end quote. Ebenezer Bodwell, or Bodwell, was appointed to replace Brigger, but was dismissed in 1879 due to financial irregularities. And Bodwell was then replaced by William Ellis, who served from 1879, oh, I think I have a slide on this, there we go, yes. Uh, who served from 1879 to 1897, but was suspended in the 1880s and had his duties reduced and basically split with William Thompson in 1891. Brigger, Bodwell, and Ellis were not trained engineers, yet they were placed in charge of canal operations and construction. The water supply issue had never really been solved. As I mentioned, they kind of wanted to wait until after Confederation because I expect they expected that it was going to cost a heck of a lot of money. Water was still brought in uh, to the height of the system at the deep cut by the Grand River, 
or just sorry, south of the deep cut um, from the Grand River uh, via the feeder canal. One of the major projects of the third canal was lowering the depth for both vessel and, uh, and to allow more water supply of the canal beyond Thorold to meet the elevation of Lake Erie, uh, allowing for lake water to power the system. Um, the canal builders were somewhat limited by the materials available to them. The locks of the first canal were made of wood, locally cut. When it was enlarged, the canal locks were rebuilt out of stone. The third canal used a combination of stone, uh, stone and cement, the, uh, st sorry, stone and stone cement. The stone walls of the locks were very impressive, but the floors of the locks were made of this stone cement, which is kind of interesting. The style of the canal was virtually unchanged, which is also interesting to me. The technology and materials and all the elements of the canal can change over the hundred years of construction, but the basic principles of controlling water are effectively the same as they were in the 1830s. On the third canal, like the two before it, the locks are filled or were filled and emptied using a slack water system of canal ponds, canal pond reservoirs, and waste weirs. This helped to maintain the water levels in each lock and pond, regardless of the happenings and traffic of any lock. The sluice gates, the gated windows, which appear, which, sorry, which allow water in and out of the lock were on the lock gates as they were on the first and second. Basically the same system today on the Welland Ship Canal, though the design of the locks are a little bit different. We have sluice tunnels and little windows along the bottom of the lock rather than the sluice gates in the, in the gates of the lock. That's another lecture. <clears throat> the confluence of railways in Niagara, however, was not a problem for the first canal, uh, the problem the first canal builders had to accommodate. Swing rail bridges along with many other regular road bridges were constructed, but the most famous of all and the jewel in the in engineering crown of the canal was the railway tunnel built to accommodate the Grand Trunk Railway. An important, uh, a wonderful and important example of Victorian engineering, the tunnel was well loved and appreciated for its beautiful architecture, not just its impressive engineering. Today, the tunnel is well loved and as one of the few well-preserved elements of the third well and canal. The tunnel itself is certainly deserving of its own lecture someday. Other normal canal building problems plagued the works usually related to the utter destruction and damage of the local, dramatic damage and change of the local landscape. In the deepening of the deep cut at Port Robinson, the construction crews ran into the exact same problem virtually in the same location that the first canal crews experienced when they tried to tackle the underground water sources that flooded the works when they dug too deep. Flooding and weather were equally difficult as they were on the earlier works, but on a much larger scale. It was far more dangerous and far more dramatic. For example, the newly built weir at Port de Luzi collapsed after heavy rains, impacted navigation on the second canal, and delayed work considerably, something the builders of the, of the first canal were all too familiar with. Irritations and complaints from the local community were also a part of the canal building experience. It's not easy to make everyone happy, and the third canal project was no exception. The, exp uh, the expropriation of land, flooding of fields, flooding of cemeteries, including graves of soldiers in the War of 1812 at Beaver Dams, and the route itself, whether it passed too, uh, passed too far away or too close or through uh, the land, dogged the works as they did on the first canal. Everybody either wanted it, didn't want it, wanted to be close, didn't want to be close. You can just imagine the frustration of dealing with local landowners. The difference this time is that the decision makers weren't to be found at an office in St. Catharines. They were to be found at the department headquarters in Ottawa. And so in this way, the removal of the local influence over the construction of the canal meant that sometimes the impact of the canal on the people here in the community, in its, uh, in, in, here in the community and its path were less likely to be heard. And in this way, the local connection to the canal and eventually its preservation was lost. 
The construction itself is also very Victorian in that the worksite was literally transitional between old and new. I think I have a picture, yeah, there we go. Um, the second industrial revolution brought a variety of new inventions like steam shovels and dredges and construction railways to the worksite, which was simultaneously still populated by shovel wielding na navies and horse teams. The confluence of technology, lack of engineering professionalism, and the normal environmental challenges of bringing of building a, a canal meant that many uh, meant many accidents. Unfortunately, little information on the accidents and the men who most certainly died building the third canal exist, primarily because of the government's lack of record keeping, but also because they refused to acknowledge some subcontractors and had virtually no relationship with subcontractors. All the information we can glean from government records are mostly rejected claims against the government for lost equipment and horses, uh, either in sort of accidents or um, where the works would break and sort of machinery would be lost or horses would be lost. The press coverage, while limited, was detailed for the period and an article from the Toronto Mail mentioned that approximately 300 stone masons and cutters and nearly 3,000 navies and approximately 400 horses and teams were employed on the canal works in 1875. It's a pretty big operation. The canal was mostly completed and open to traffic in 1881, but because of delays to the aqueduct at the Welland River, only ships with an 11 foot four inch draft, almost the 12 foot desired depth, just there, could sail over the old canal aqueduct. This was incredibly frustrating. And of course it would continue and uh, continue to be frustrating until 1887 when the new aqueduct was finally completed. Interestingly enough, they would to, to increase the depth a little bit more to get some more ships in, they'd close the uh, gates at so water was coming in from Lake Erie, but they closed the gates at the guard lock, closed the gates. There was a, a lock at, hopefully I'm saying this, hopefully I've got this right, Port Robinson, maybe Allenburg. And then they'd let water in from the feeder canal. So that would temporarily raise that whole stretch to let <laughs> ships in, anyway, wild. And super frustrating to deal with. The story of the Third Canal Aqueduct is also another one of those stories that should be its own lecture, but I want to pause here because the project was mired on all fronts and it's a really good example of everything we've been talking about so far. Faulty, overextended, and underexperienced contractors, weather, supplies, budget, corruption, and the thorn in the side of every canal builder, water. Everything went wrong from the start of construction in 1878. The dam installed, you can sort of see it here, the dam installed to a control Chippewa Creek was facilitating, uh, which was facilitating construction, collapsed not once, not twice, but three times, flooding the works in January, March, and October, causing huge delays and major damage. Stonemasons went out on strike in November, and then they did again in 1883. Of course, the dam collapsed again in 1880, and work stalled for seven months. Contractors, it seemed, were overextended and in over their heads, both literally and figuratively. The contractors gave up the contract in October of 1880. To, rep to replace the contractor quickly, the government sent the tender to a handful of known contractors, which the press and the opposition did not like at all, since the value was so large, well over $10,000. It seems that the next contractor, Beamer and Sullivan, maintained certain connections with Quebec politicians, and that the connections had something to do with their selection to continue the work. Regardless, they only began construction in earnest in 1882, which is two years, almost two full years after the last time the dam broke, but quickly ran out of money, so the work was delayed again until they could resume. And with much difficulty uh, brought the opening of the canal, they finally finished the project in time for the 1887 season. 1887, this is almost, what, six years after the rest of the canal is basically ready and, uh, and built. Unfortunately, the aqueduct is one of the many casualties of the Welland Ship Canal since the line was maintained south of Thorold 
everything, mostly everything in its path was demolished. I find it most notable that the historiography on the canal usually stops with the opening of the works. And so more, with more research and study, I think another lecture of mine is to come, will focus on operational matters and stories rather than its construction. In the end, I think that's where most of our questions lie today, how the canals operated and what it would have been like to live next to them as central as they were to our community. It is in this way that the historiography has contributed to the forgotten nature of the third canal today. There are so, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> there are so few operational notes. Uh, sorry, there are a few operational notes though that I would like to share with you that I found interesting. As I mentioned earlier, the 1870s were particularly troublesome time for both government and civil service. Both were marred by one corruption scandal after the next. The examples of Woodruff, Brigger, Bodwell, and Ellis that I mentioned earlier did seem, however, to teach a lesson to the first professionally trained engineer, William Thompson, who was appointed engineer in charge in 1897, even though he had been effectively performing the role since 1891. That's those two, William Ellis and William Thompson, the most confusing. They traded titles, they had the same titles, they really difficult to tell what who was doing what at the time. I want to know, note briefly <clears throat> on the confusing nature of the titles, especially with regards to the heads of projects. There was, of course, a department, demar, excuse me, tar, departmental chief engineer in Ottawa, his name was John Page, uh, as the top public servant responsible to the minister. Here in Niagara, usually a superintending engineer was responsible for the works, but the titles were somewhat fluid. For the most confusing example during the construction of the Welland Ship Canal, when of course the third was still in operation, engineer J.L. Weller was appointed to replace Thompson in 1901. And when the Welland Ship Canal project was to uh, get underway in terms of construction in 1913, Welland, uh, sorry, Weller look at, looked after both projects initially until mid-1913 when Lucius Hera, Lucius Dean Hera, probably the best name on this list, maybe Ebenezer Bodwell, or Bodwell, excuse me. Everybody, everybody take a second and put in the chat box which name you prefer more, Ebenezer Bodwell or Lucius Dean Hera. Let's have a little poll going on. These are pretty fantastic names. I just have to say very Victorian names. Anyway, so Lucius Hara took over as superintendent of the third canal in 1913 when Weller was sort of off to work on the Welland Ship Canal. But Weller and Grant, Alexander Grant afterwards maintained the title of superintending engineer. So we have superintendent and then we have superintending engineer, but also um, Hera was an engineer, and so he's like superintendent engineer in charge of work or in charge, and then superintending engineer. So you can see it's extremely frustrating and very confusing as a historian to look back to find the chain of command and the operations on the ground, uh, how they must have worked, and if it was uh, been quite sort of it has been quite sort of the chase to understand how it all worked. Uh, but that's bureaucracy, I guess, for you. I must pause here and thank Arden Fair and Robert Taylor for their assistance and sharing primary sources with me uh, for some of the information regarding the top job of either superintendent, superintendent, engineer, engineer, engineering in charge, whatever. Don't forget to put your favorite name in the chat box. I'm looking forward to a little poll later. Speaking of bureaucracy, we saw in 1830 the beginnings of the government involvement in the operation of the day-to-day -day, as more of the government members were made directors of the Welland Canal Company. Merritt and other directors, as well as superintendents, complained then that the involvement of so many departments in the operations often slowed the work. Almost 100 years later, the same problems plagued Superintendent Hera who luckily for us was a great writer and made his position clear, quite clear. And this is one of the good things about having a, a big bureaucracy and having um, the sort of the chief engineer of the department in another city is that most of the conversations and most of the communication was written down uh, and done by mail. Uh, so luckily we can go back and see that. Whereas on the first canal, it seems that most decisions were kind of made uh, in person, but 
with some, with lots of mail back and forth as well. Um, but a lot of sort of the minutia of the Well and Canal Company was done by Merritt with the superintendents sort of in person, very hand, in a very hands-on way. Anyway, in one case, the lock and bridge tenders of the and some repairmen of Portaluzzi from Portaluzzi to Thorold had not been paid. Hera wrote to the department in Ottawa. Quote, the men certainly have good cause for their grievance, and it is a wonder to me that they have been as patient as they have been in the, la in the past. It is a shame that the way these men are receiving their pay due to the great delay in writing the checks. As you are aware, there is no delay here. It all occurs at Ottawa. I trust that in future, the checks will issue promptly from Ottawa so that all cause for complaint will be removed. The reason for the delay in payments? Well, that the Civil Service Commission, the body responsible for all the appointments, uh, was not in a position to appoint the necessary staff to the department's accountant branch. So folks here in Niagara weren't paid because the Civil Service Commission couldn't appoint the accountants to write the checks. Again, the political interference from Ottawa and the Civil Service Commission had an impact on the operation of the canal, since the hope of the government was uh, in the 1920s was to employ as many returned soldiers from the Great War as possible, which of course makes sense and is very entirely honorable, except that it seems that the Civil Service Commission didn't fully understand the nature of work along the canal. Hera again wrote to the deputy minister on July 10th, 1922 about the challenge of hiring disabled veterans for canal positions. Please forgive his language here. His note also reveals a bit about the, uh, a bit of the detail about what work was like at the time. He does use a couple of words that maybe are not uh, appropriate for today. Um, so just uh, bear that in mind. Quote, the Welling Canal is an important public work and has been kept going we can stand a limited number of crippled and disabled or disabled men on the locks and bridges, but we must have a good many who are perfectly sound physically and who can do good, hard manual work as this is required quite frequently. It would be unwise to load the canal staff up with crippled men. And it seems from his letter, it seems like that was the intention of the commission was to send um, mostly disabled veterans to the canal project, perhaps because there's sort of a uh, misunderstanding in what kind of canal work was, you know, just opening the lock gate, well, anybody can do that. Um, but here it goes on. Quote, if the commission proposed to make a charitable institution out of the Welling Canal, it will be very difficult to operate uh, as it should. It is very unsatisfactory to have men in our employ who are obliged to be off every now and again, or who have or who have to keep going to the hospital continually. We prefer to have and should have men who will remain steadily at their work. The canal operation is a night and day proposition. It is open 24 hours a day. He's not happy. By 1930, the operation of the Third Welling Canal was winding down after almost 20 years of construction of the new Welland Ship Canal. In the remaining seasons, traffic packed the canal. Uh-oh, do I have the phone? Uh, I have, remind me, I have a photo to show afterwards that I forgot to include in the slides. It's a photo of Portaluzzi showing, uh, showing Portaluzzi just packed uh, with ships uh, overwintering before the last season. In this, I'll find it right away. Uh, in the spring of 1930, traffic was diverted from the third canal to the ship canal between Port Weller and Lock Three. From there, they can connected to the old canal to Thorold. Here is a really good image of Lock Three. I believe this is from 27 or 28, maybe 29. So they're um, sorry, no, it'd be 1930. Anyway. Uh, so they're using Port Weller to here, Lock 3, and then they make a slight left and go up the canal uh, and around. Uh, there you can see it. mostly a problem of the works weren't 100% finished, but also a problem of water. Again, water always being a huge issue. Uh, they connected out to Thorold on the other side. The depth was enlarged to 14 feet, uh, but was on its way to 18 feet um, in, the, in the third canal sections. Um, on uh, sorry, yeah, on, uh, in the reaches anyway, they tried to uh, deepen them out. There was a wonderful dredge machine um, 
Anyway, uh, on November 22nd, 1930, the last boat passed up the third canal locks, 11 to 24 in this photo, you can see. From this time to the end of the season, all traffic used the new ship canal route. By the way, today's depth, which was not the opening depth, but today's depth is 29 feet or 9.1 meters. Of course, the new ship canal was built for practically the same reasons the third canal was built. Larger ships and high volumes of traffic demanded enlargement once again. The feeling of disappointment in the current condition of the third canal, both the existing locks and the locks demolished or filled in and buried, was not a contemporary one and not something the people of 1930s St. Catharines were feeling. And as I've detailed throughout my lecture, I think it comes down to a few reasons why, and I generally, the his, and generally the historical community, consider the third Welling Canal generally lost and forgotten. As I've mentioned, the public were not interested in the historical value of the works. There was some consideration in 1930 about preserving some of the second and some of the third canal structures, excuse me, but there was some difficulty in, signing, in assigning the work and the responsibility would have fallen to the historic sites and monuments board, which were not equipped with engineers. Uh, and unfortunately, all attempts at preservation or restoration in the 1930s were deemed too expensive, or indeed, since the government was recovering from the Great Depression, there was hardly any budgetary resources available. After the Third Canal uh, was closed to traffic, there was great effort to have it filled in as quickly as possible. Public opinion saw the old waterways as dangerous eyesores, and after 1932, several, campa several campaigns were launched to have them filled in as quickly as possible. Instead of trying to save it, the public seemed to have little connection with the waterway and did little to save it. You can see some of the infill in this aerial photograph from the late 30s, um, which is really quite interesting. Some of the um, canal reaches, particularly this one, look like they've already been flooded. Uh, this uh, canal pond as well has already been, um, the road has already been taken over it. Uh, and here as well, completely closed off and basically filled in. Locks, reaches, and bridges were traffic hazards and were dismantled, destroyed, or filled in by 1934. And there was an idea to fill it in to become some sort of parkway, some drive, drive parkway or parkway of parks or whatever, but that project did not happen. There were a few, ex there were a few exceptions, of course. There were a few exceptions, of course, the main one being Lock 1 in Port Luzi, Muir Brothers Shipyards, which you can see in sort of the top right quadrant of this photo, uh, located in the Henley was still operational and used Lock 1 to bring ships into the yard. Lock 1, by the way, of the third canal is all the way over here. This is Lock 1 of the second canal. So anyway, um, and you can see some third canal ships in, in this photo, this aerial photo. Uh, Okay, um, after the Muir, oh, uh, yes, so they used Lock 1 to bring ships into the yard. After the Muir brothers uh, closed in the mid-1960s, Lock 1 was decommissioned and eventually turned into a power generating station in 1990. But you can see some familiar sights in this photo from 1937, of course, a rowing Henley match underway. But if you uh, look, there's no Rennie Park, <laughs> which is today like basically across from uh, across from the Maple Leaf Rubber Factory there, building there, where those people are standing almost on this little peninsula over yonder. Um, but also, I just want to draw your attention to this big ship, big big Third Canal ship in um, in the Henley. Imagine that there today. That'd be crazy. Because most of the canal from Lock 2 to the new ship canal was demolished, filled in, and basically erased so quickly, little evidence tangibly exists for our community to use as a part of its identity in the same way that we use the infrastructure that's associated with the second Welland Canal. 
Factory buildings and locks are present and daily reminders to us about the prowess of the second canal. It constitutes much of our park and green space and its factories constitute most of our impressive and recognizable architecture and built heritage. Because, of the third canal, because the third canal was not built to supply power to local factories, but instead for international trade, as we've heard throughout this lecture, there's no associated infrastructure or built heritage for us to be reminded of the presence of the third canal or its existence in the same way as it is uh, with the second. You, you already have to know about the third canal basically to recognize its impact on our city. That lack of built heritage and tangible clues of the third canal inside the urban limits of the city certainly make it lost, certainly make it lost and forgotten to our residents. A shame today, but probably the way they wanted it in the 30s. There are a couple of visible locks. Lock two, as I earlier mentioned, is half buried in JC Park. And lock three is fully buried, uh, not fully buried, sorry, filled in. Uh, you can see the top of the stone. Uh, just behind Anchor Point Manor on uh, Anchor Point, sorry, retirement residence on Ontario Street. There is also one piece of Third Canal. Uh, there is also one piece of Third Canal history in our urban Saint Cath in, in urban Saint Catharines that pops up on our uh, history mystery radar here at the museum and can sometimes be generally confusing. It's these bridge abutments for the old Welland Railway Bridge located on Scott Street in John Page Park. Funnily enough, John Page, as I, meant, have, have I, as I mentioned earlier, was the chief engineer of the Department of Public Works first, then later the Department of Railways and Canals, get this, from 1853 to 1890. So I think John Page <laughs> is a lecture topic uh, as chief engineer of the Department of Railways and Canals. Interesting guy. Um, anyway, bridge abutments Welland, uh, were for the uh, Welland Railway, uh, the division of the uh, Grand Trunk Railway, which you can see here on our uh, wacky turned map. So again, Lake Ontario is over on your right-hand screen, right-hand side, and Lake Erie is on the left. I'm sorry if it's backwards for you. It might be backwards. Um, anyway, you can see here, uh, so this is, get my annotate tool out here. So this is Scott, whoops, that was bad. <laughs> Should be better at that by now. This is Scott, uh, here's Geneva as you can see. Um, and so, uh, and there's this sort of, uh, and there's Lake as well. And so here is this bridge and uh, for some reason, it was uh, left over when the canal was filled in. And uh, most of this area, sh I should also mention, most of this corridor was not developed until 19, at least beginning in the 1960s. So a lot of this was sort of just like vacant. Um, so you have agriculture in the north and sort of increasing development in the south and in between is this sort of thing. So anyway, 1960s, 70s, uh, Fairview Mall is located right in this area. The Lake Street Service Center takes up a huge chunk of space um, uh, for the, the city's uh, public works. They have a different name, but anyway, there we go. So you know what these are now? These little bridge abutments in John Bay Page Park, they're fenced off because they are falling apart, but uh, and so they're not safe to be climbed on. But they are railway bridge abutments that went over the third canal. That's why they're in a weird spot. Like it doesn't make sense. If the if you were thinking it was a road bridge, it doesn't make sense that they're there. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> um, additionally, the mysterious nature of the locks that are located east of the present canal on the other side of GM, on the east side of GM, uh, add to this mysterious condition. Some of the land is used by the Bruce Trail. It passes through there. Other is private seaway property. Not much of it is accessible to hikers and canal lovers. Um, and all of it is somewhat dangerous. Uh, some things you can, most of it you can get to, uh, but you have to be careful about where you go because the, uh, the 
Third Canal is still used as a uh, waste sluice, basically, for wastewater. And so it's, we never know when uh, additional water will be heading down that direction. But the locks, my main point anyway, is that the locks over there, they're over there from the urban center, don't do much for sharing the story of the canal for, you know, they do for canal lovers and, uh, and people who go there, but for anybody who doesn't even know about them, which is most people, uh, they don't do much. There is more to it than the lack of built heritage and tangible evidence, of course. The historiographical challenge, challenges concerning the uh, Third Canal also contribute to it being forgotten. For example, Merritt and Weller, along with the construction, usually dominate the narrative. While we try to move away from this trend of the great man theory, history tends to focus on the great men. And Merritt and Weller offer exciting characters and compelling narratives. The first canal, though no remnants are visible today, benefits from being the firstborn. If we go back to our middle child syndrome, benefits be from being the firstborn and is remembered easily since it, since it begins the story. Additionally, the Well and Chip Canal benefits from being the baby. <laughs> we can call it that, a big baby. Uh, its construction fascinated the world, not only our community. It so quickly and easily overshadowed the third that it was almost forgotten even before it closed. And so in this way, our own study and history of the canal has contributed in part, anyway, to its being forgotten. Sources available to us as historians continue to be frustrating in studying the canal. Early canal records were either not kept or kept so poorly that they uh, provide little information. With the third and fourth canals, much of the decision-making was made in Ottawa by the department. And that's where most of the records considering its construction and operation exist at the National Archives. Excuse me, making it more difficult to achieve a fulsome picture for most local historians. Another historiographical challenge is that so much of the history written concerns itself with only the planning and construction of each project. And I mentioned that before briefly, but most of our storytelling around the canal begins and ends with construction. And I guess operating the canal on a day-to-day -day basis isn't the most exciting thing. It's probably pretty boring, but so many of the changes, minor enlargements and additional infrastructure that was added to the canal uh, that don't appear in mainstream histories um, are the ones that are probably going to be the most tangible, the remaining elements of the narrative today. You know, what's that thing over there? Oh, well, it was added, you know, way after the main construction period and nobody knows about it because that research hasn't been done. Considering the operations and their ongoing impact the canals have had on our city, even beyond their closure, should be our focus moving forward. The third Welland Canal is the longest operating canal out of the four iterations of the Welland Canals. It was an important part of McDonald's national policy, and St. Catharines became an, became an important hub, not just to Niagara, but to the Great Lakes, uh, and also to the country and eventually the world. Its construction changed the very fabric of our urban community, rem removing the presence of ships from downtown St. Catharines. Yet this vital link and important public work is lost and virtually forgotten today, dismantled and buried long before the heritage community could ever rally public and political support to save it. The canal disappeared from our urban environment and is slowly disappearing from the memories of our community. Almost by design, little built heritage and public infrastructure remains, making its narrative far less tangible than the other canals. Its shift away from the local waterway directed directly benefiting, sorry, its shift away from local water, from a local waterway, directly benefiting, benefiting, that's a hard word today, directly benefiting the local community built by strangers in Ottawa are overshadowed by the great men like William Hamilton Merritt. My call to action this evening then is a simple one. Change your mindset and view of our city in a different, to a different way. Recognize that history exists all around us, even if there is no tangible record of the past in our view. Realize that we are active participants in our history and that the narrative isn't yet finished and that our study and use of the past is just as important as our participation in it today. The history of the third Welling Canal is an example to all of us 
of how we can so easily lose and forget the past. Thank you so much for attending tonight's lecture. I'm sorry it went so long, I hope it was worth it. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to deliver the high quality programming and super long lectures, <laughs> I'm sorry, that you expect from us. Every bit helps. To make a donation, please call the museum during our operating hours at 905-984-8880. If you have any questions about tonight's pr uh, presentation, and of course, don't forget to participate in our poll, our Ebenezer Lucius poll. <laughs> you can post them in the YouTube chat box to the right hand side of your screen. If you're using a tablet or a smartphone, you might be, not be able to see the chat box or the chat box might be located underneath the video, depending on how you're watching it. So you can also put your questions in the comments uh, below and Kathleen will be watching uh, all of those places to help out with some question moderation. While I give you a few minutes to post your questions and comments and participate in our poll, I'd just like to remind everyone of our next lecture on November 10th, when, when we'll present stories from the front. I guarantee it's a shorter program than tonight. <laughs> I'd also like to remind everyone to please like, follow, subscribe, smash that subscribe button on our social media challenge channels, including here on our YouTube uh, channel to stay in the loop with all of our virtual programming uh, in these difficult and online virtual times, including if you missed any of the previous virtual lectures, uh, you can catch all of them on our playlist. You can, also, you can also catch the virtual guided spirit walks at Victoria Lawn Cemetery. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, someone is, just wanna make sure it's okay, okay. Oh, the poll is a dead heat, Kathy says, okay. Um, so I'd also like everyone uh, to remind everyone to uh, subscribe and like and sh follow and share so you don't miss anything. Please also share the museum in your own social networks, share, 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 to help more of our community join in the historical adventures. If you love the deep dive nature of a political of a lecture series, why not also try our podcasts? We have two podcasts, Museum Chat Live and One Hour in the Past. You can catch the podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. A recent episode of One Hour in the Past went out about the fur trade. I have a three-part series about Victorian tweets, our exhibit about Victorian tweets. And there's a very, 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 very special guest coming up on Museum Chat Live very famous um, historian, uh, very well known in the country. Uh, I'm not going to say his name, but uh, he's coming up on the podcast because I don't know if we can officially announce it. I don't know. Uh, Kathy, let me know if I can officially announce who's going to be joining us on the podcast in the coming weeks ahead of Remembrance Day. That's maybe a clue. Anyway, now I will take your questions. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm sorry you just get my face, but I need to go to, oh gosh, all the, holy moly, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of <laughs> comments. Okay, I'm going to try to go through them. I apologize for how terrible this will be. Hello, everyone. It's really good to see everyone. Thank you so much for coming along on our journey tonight. Uh, there is a bit of of delay, uh, just to let you know. Uh, yes, thank you for my missing the boat pun. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. Uh, it was, I had to put it in somewhere. Okay, uh, I'm guessing the I'd watch and me too's and all that kind of thing um, is uh, in relation to all the other lectures that I've signed myself up to do. Uh, so yeah, I'll let you know when that's gonna happen. Um, I think Kathy answered your photo, Brian, about, uh, about, uh, where the photo was. I'm, I'm not sure cause I, I can't see it anymore, but hopefully that is the right answer. Um, and Kathy will get back to you on the other stuff. Uh, where Laurel asks where the, uh, railway tunnel is located. It is the, I'm gonna go and share my screen. We're gonna head over to the, uh, I knew this question would come along. And so um, I've lost Zoom. Hold on one second, I'm gonna share my screen. You think I'd be seamless at this point. Okay, we're gonna head over to the uh, Historic Well and Canals Mapping Project to check out this um, answer. 
of where the Grand Trunk Railway Tunnel is. By the way, I should mention there was a pedestrian sort of uh, street tunnel um, as well that covered sort of area around um, Glendale Avenue-ish. We'll, ha we'll have a look at that other map that I, oh, it might be on here, I wonder. Anyway, okay. The tunnel, let me see here, is between uh, locks. Am I right? Oh my gosh, I'm wrong. There I am. Sorry, in the wrong place. There we go. Between locks 18 and 19. And this green dotted line was the, uh, the um, line of the tunnel, the line of the Grand Trunk. Uh, so you can see it crossed crossed over, uh, would have crossed over Ten Mile Creek um, ish in and in around this area, probably somewhere. Uh, and then uh, eventually it was it sent over. Um, so this this part of the railway still exists. Uh, this bridge over here uh, on top of uh, lock four um, is still there for the uh, Sitsian. I hope I'm right. I hope it's CN. It's probably CP just because I said CN. Anyway, um, okay, so yeah, the Grand Trunk Tunnel is here. It would have been sort of, uh, you can see the entrance to it here. Uh, sorry, this is not the best resolution, but you can sort of work your way. If you want to explore this yourself on Google, go to the big canal pond for the flight locks, which is here. Go to this little pokey section and then work your way just along this road here. And you can see the, um, do we have a photo? Yeah, we have a photo here. Oh, and Colleen has actually paired a, a historic photo of the tunnel with a current photo. Uh, so that's pretty great. I'm not gonna encourage people to hike out there um, because technically it's on Seaway land. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, sorry, there's so many screens. Anyway, so that's where it is. So the um, the west side is good. The east side is somewhat flooded sometimes as to my understanding. Let me go back here. So the east side that can't, comes out into the golf course uh, over yonder is sometimes flooded. As you can see, it's got some water here. So, um, so there you go. So I'll just zoom out an idea of that. Beautiful, it's still there. Um, and that is the famous Blue Ghost Tunnel if you're into ghost stories. Okay, let me go back to our question. Uh, stop share. Questions. Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to go quickly. Okay. Uh, oh, wow. Ebenezer, Lucius. Can someone, Kathy, can you count? Uh, can you, can you count up Lucius and Ebenezer? Um, and we'll see what we come up with. Okay, Dorothy, sure, well, it was a nice shift fast right by my house. You can see the remnants of one of the old locks, JC Park, yes. Yes, check out the, the very sort of north end of JC Park before you go sort of up the hill by the, um, uh, the playground. It goes down and there's sort of that opening. If you're not looking closely, you, you might miss it. Um, so the, the, uh, lock two is there. Uh, there's a good view of it from the pedestrian bridge. Uh, my Brian said, oh, sorry, uh, James says, funny, there's no barrier in the canal picture. Yeah, <laughs> yep. There's some really great pictures of the Welland Canal Force, which uh, which will probably be another lecture someday. Some great photographs of the Welland Canal Force, um, like literally marching right next to the water. It's kind of neat. Uh, Brian says, my grandparents remembered having to wait in the 1920s for ships to pass the third canal by what is now Fairview Mall and also waiting on Queen Street near Victoria Lawn. Yeah, I, it's, it's it, wild. Uh, that's the best way to say it. I think imagining that, I, and I mean, you can do that all over the city if you know where the root of the canal was, but imagining that at Fairview Mall is, is wild to me. Yeah, seeing a ship there would be, would be crazy. Lots of stories about drownings. Yes, tons of tons of drownings. Uh, first, second, third, fourth, as well, a, a few in the fourth as well. Um, yep. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Um, Donna, if you're interested in any particular photo, 
Um, I can run it for you uh, in terms of dates, locations, that kind of thing. I try to avoid captions because either they're not readable on your screens or they block the photo. So I, I try to present an un, I don't, I don't want anything obstructing the photos. Uh, aerial photos, usually planes, and, um, but maybe hot air balloon, I, I don't know, but usually it's planes. Are you serious that the Lucius and Ebenezer is tied? That's wonderful. Well, I guess I'll have to be the tie break then. Um, oof. I really like, so like Ebenezer Bodwell is very Victorian, but I really like the full name of Lucius Dean Hera. And so Lucius Dean Hera wins our pool tonight. Yes, Brian, uh, the, the lock one would have been used until you actually used um, uh, until the Muir brothers stopped using it, but the, um, but decommissioned, officially decommissioned was a little bit later in the 60s. Uh, yeah, John Page, but also um, John Page, who else? Oh, Hera. Hera, I think, will be a really good character in our spirit walk someday. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, Oh, extra picture. Laura, 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 Laura says extra picture. Let me just find that really quick. Um, is there anything else that I'm missing? Lots of information. Yeah. Okay. You'll just, if you want to see this extra picture, you'll have to stick with me um, as I just quickly look for it. I'm so sorry. This is so hilarious. Okay. I know exactly where it is. I just hopefully can get there quickly. Um, nope. There we go. Uh, okay, 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 almost there, almost there. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pick this one from, okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay, it looks like that's the one I have to pick. Okay, I'm gonna share this. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this is our extra picture from the standard collection 1937. Um, of a bunch of ships overwintering at Porto Lucy. Busy, 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 busy. And so you can already see, like, by the time the, sorry, the third canal was already late in terms of trade. So by the time it was finished and ready, you know, it's already running late. And so that's why they turn around in, you know, 20 years and say, oh gosh, we need another canal. So it's packed in, in 37. And uh, the, also you can see a more familiar shape of ship here that is more similar to what we see today. Okay, let me just head back to, so that's our extra picture. Uh, oh, Ebenezer. Oh, last count was 5-5. Five, five. Ebene okay, so that's, I can't do the math, but I think Ebenezer's one because I voted for Lucius. Okay, any other? Um, yes, uh, please do check out our uh, online collection. There's a good number of our collection online at uh, the museum's website, stcatholicmuseum.ca. You can explore eMuseum, which is our sort of uh, the public facing virtual side of our, um, uh, on, uh, of our collection database. Um, so yeah, uh, check that out. Lots of information, great pictures. Um, Making sure that there's no other questions that I missed. Did I miss anything else? I really do encourage you to uh, check out, sorry to repeat myself, but do check out Colleen's uh, Historic Well and Canals Mapping Project, um, and then go for a walk in some of those uh, areas where the canal is no longer there, like John Page Park or um, uh, JC Park. Uh, and down here by the uh, museum and try and see if you can see what the impact is like. Um, it's really neat to uh, just to just to explore. As you can see, my brain is done. So I think because 
uh, I have gone through all the questions and I'm so, um, so, 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 so floored by all these wonderful comments and questions. Um, thank you so, so much, everyone, for participating and tuning in tonight. I'm happy to announce. Um, I'm happy to announce that Ebenezer Bodwell has won our superintendent con contest. The other thing is, um, uh, uh, let me just text Kathy and see if I can announce. Um, uh, the other thing is I, I saw a couple of comments about um, that someone would watch a whole lecture of me annotating maps and pictures. Um, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> uh, I don't think that, honestly, it's not fun for everybody. It's probably fun for just a few of us. Um, but I'm very uh, thankful that you enjoy my nerdiness because sometimes, it can, you know, you guys are, you guys are out there. Um, you guys are out there. And uh, so I have no real feedback other than the, 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 the thing. So I have, uh, to, just to sign off and to really just finish off, I'm happy to announce uh, that uh, we can tell you that uh, historian Tim Cook will be on Museum Chat Live in the coming weeks in advance of Remembrance Day. So with that, definitely subscribe to Museum Chat Live. And we will see you in a couple of weeks on November 10th for Stories from the Front. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely evening.